Well, hello there, everybody. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the very first lesson in the financial sector, uh, which is all about money. So um, one thing that we haven't actually really talked about is money. So I'll kind of show you what money looks like if you haven't seen it. This is a giant jar of, uh, of shredded up money, right? That's, that's or at least it used to be money um, before the Federal Reserve said, eh, it's worn out. We don't really want this uh, anymore and, and all that good stuff. Um, and then I have some other money that, that I'll kind of show you as well. So we've got, you know, some paper money and then we've got some commodity money that's also kind of exciting because it's actually a chunk of silver that we use as money. Um, we've got all this time in economics and we actually haven't even told you what it is. So money is, here you go, what money does. That's, that's actually the definition. Um, I know that sounds weird, but that means that you have to know the functions of money in order to actually understand it. And the three functions are medium of exchange, unit of account, store value. They have to do all three to be money. So let's kind of go through what those three functions of money are. And then, you know, hopefully you can understand what it actually is. So the first thing is, if, and by the way, so anything can be used as money. Anything can be used as money, as long as it does these three things really well. So the first would be like, when you go to the grocery store, you see that little picture at the bottom left, you go to the grocery store and you buy something. Right? You're like, ah, I'm going to buy this gallon of milk. That's using money as a medium of exchange. Literally, you're using it to get something else. It's the intermediary between you and the thing you want. The nice thing is, is it avoids the problem of a barter system. And a barter system, if you've never used it, would be like you saying, OK, you have this mask and I have this pen and let's exchange. And the problem with that is that it relies on the person who has the mask wanting the pen and the person who has the pen wanting the mask. We call that a double coincidence of wants. And unfortunately, they don't happen that often. Like you go to the grocery store and you're like, I want to buy this gallon of milk. And the cashier is like, what do you have? And you're like, I have this pen. And they're like, uh, no, we don't want that. So the, the problem with bartering is, is that it reduces transactions, right? It's a problem with transactions. So we need something that can be the medium of exchange. Number two, you need money that functions basically as a unit of account. Just like we have kilograms or kilometers to measure mass or distance, we have dollars to measure value. And in this, in this context, right, you can quickly look at a gallon of milk and say, I roughly know in my head, maybe you do, how much a gallon of milk costs. And it's around three, four dollars for a gallon of milk. You would know, you know, okay, roughly you have this kind of cup of coffee that you decided you were going to purchase at Starbucks, and it's probably about $3, right? So you can judge value of things. That's using money as a unit of account. You're just saying, I'm going to judge the value of that. You don't even necessarily have to buy it, right? That's medium of exchange, but judging value of something. The third is store of value. This is the idea of the money in your wallet, the third picture down there, is going to generally have the same value tomorrow, next week, six months from now that it did today. You know, inflation will slowly erode that store of value, and you don't want too much inflation because it actually harms um, the, the unit of account measure because you can't really tell how much your money's, you know, how much stuff is worth, but also it harms the store of value. So inflation erodes both of those. But generally speaking, even low levels of inflation are okay in terms of store of value. So you need something that's going to keep its value, not be really volatile in value. So going up and down, whoa, 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 that's not a very good store of value, right? Um, so the traits of money, right? If you're kind of thinking about things that usually are money, you know, usually it's uniform. Usually it's divisible into small amounts. Um, it's portable. It's usually scarce. Like you can't go pick it up off the street. And it generally has to be widely accepted. So there's some things that aren't particularly good money. Um, Bitcoin is a good example of that. Bitcoin's a great speculative instrument in the sense that you can speculate on its value. Um, but it doesn't function as a medium of exchange terribly well. The, the blockchain technology kind of has a friction in terms of transactions. It takes a little time to process, especially smaller transactions. The second issue is, is that it doesn't really help you measure value. One Bitcoin is about $40,000 when I'm recording this lesson. And so it's hard for people to conceptualize like 0 0.000002 Bitcoins. And that would be like how much it would cost to buy a package of pens, right? So it's hard for people to use money if the unit of account is kind of wonky like that. So Bitcoin doesn't really work that well either. It's also not very good to store value because it vol it's very volatile, right? Up and down and up and down. So you don't want something that's really volatile in terms of value. Other stuff isn't, isn't good money either. Like credit cards are not actually money because they're just a loan. They're borrowed money in the sense that like when you use it, you're actually just using someone else's money. So a credit card is really just a borrowed function. It's not so much actually money in and of itself. Um, if the underlying asset that you're borrowing is money, um, but the actual credit card itself is not money. 
the Amazon share there, you can see is $100,000 in the picture there. Uh, Amazon and stock shares are not good money either because again, medium of exchange, they're not so good at that. They're not widely accepted. Um, but in addition that the unit of account, it's hard to judge things based on the stock value. So we wouldn't say that most financial assets, we'd say most of them are not actually money. Um, so, you know, things like Bitcoin, things like shares of stock um, loans, those aren't really good money. Now, in terms of the types of money, we can also think about two types. Um, the first and the original type of money is what we call commodity. And a commodity is actually a raw material. So if you see that word in another context, it's just a raw material or an input of some kind. So you could have like timber as a commodity or copper as a commodity. And you could actually be a trader. You could be like, just like there are stockbrokers, there are commodity traders who, who actually work kind of in commodity exchange. Um, so, uh, you know, the original form would be like this. So I'm kind of pop this bad boy open here, show you what this looks like. This is commodity money. And if we, and if I set it down right, we might be able to actually even see the date on this commodity money. I'll turn my light on. I can't actually see 19. I'm looking at the date 1921. So this is a silver dollar, right? And it's quite heavy. Um, and it's one dollar. It's, it's actually legal U.S. currency. It's one dollar. Um, the problem is that it's got other uses, right? It's solid silver. And so the issue with using commodity money, especially things like specie coins, which this is literally like a chunk of metal that's been formed into money, um, and that it has other uses, is that people don't usually actually like to use them because the value is determined by its value as a raw material, right? And in fact, that's actually why these ridges are on the side of this coin. They originally created ridges on coins, not because it makes them easier to kind of hold and things, but you could tell if someone shaved off the edges. So you might imagine if you use a really valuable material, it would be very easy to come along and just kind of shave off the edge a little bit and get a little bit of that valuable material. The problem is it devalues your coin. Um, so we kind of say that, that Commodity money is not helpful there, in addition, because it, it varies a lot in terms of the value. So it makes it very difficult for you to control your money supply, right? You're really dependent on the supply and demand of that underlying asset. Commodity money also includes this stuff. Um, and I'll show you kind of an example of what this is. And we'll pass these around in class if, you, if you're here. Silver certificate, right? And if you read it here, it says $1 in silver payable to the bearer on demand. So this is also commodity money. Um, we used to in the United States have gold certificates as well. This is $10 in gold coin payable to the bearer on demand. Again, these are just basically pieces of paper that say somewhere in a vault, right, there is an actual amount of gold and silver. And it used to be that you could convert these pieces of paper into gold and silver. We stopped doing that, again, when we moved our money off of a commodity-based system. And again, it's because you can't control how much money is in your system if you're using commodity money. So almost no economists today, you know, serious economists would argue that we should use commodity money. Very, very few countries use it. I actually can't think of any that use commodity money um, because it, it's it, it's just more problems than it solves. Um, our The value of our currency in the United States is much more stable. It's much more easy to, um, to kind of manage in terms of monetary policy and, and helping stabilize the economy um, than it was with gold, gold standard. Um, so it's really just not a, not a useful avenue. The other type of currency, which is what we use, is called fiat. So fiat currency in what every, virtually every developed country uses is, is from this Latin word fiat, meaning make, I make it so, um, to make it so, like the old uh, Jean-Luc Picard, right? And this is just money that's given its value by government order. Basically, the government says this is worth $20, it's a piece of paper, it says $20 on it. So it has no other value or use besides as money. So it avoids the problem of like the supply and demand being an issue, right? You can directly control the supply if you're the government by just saying, here's more. Um, now that does mean that if you're gonna use this, that you've got to have somebody in charge of that decision-making who's not going to just willy nilly be creating more money. And we'll talk about later in this unit why that actually isn't so much a problem in the United States, um, but why it could be in another country. Now. There are different measures of the money supply. And, and in general, we kind of measure the supply based on the liquidity of the particular type of money. And when we say liquidity, that just means how easy it is to convert something into physical cash or currency. So at the most basic level, right, you've got actually currency. So this is physical currency in circulation is called M0. So this is a zero because it's as close as you can get to being currency. It is actually currency. Another measure of the money supply is this one called MB, and it stands for monetary base. So if you see monetary base, that is directly controlled, directly controlled 
by the government. So we measure this one and it consists of physical currency, M0, plus all of the bank reserves. Now that's an important phrase to understand what that is. A bank reserve is just like your bank, right? Bank of America, US Bank, whatever, PNC. They have bank accounts with the central bank, with the government's bank, the Federal Reserve. And that bank, that central bank, basically keeps the bank accounts for all the banks. So when banks hold money, that's called a bank reserve. And actually the central bank, the kind of government bank can directly control how much they hold in reserves, right? And to some extent, they can influence that amount as we'll learn in this unit. So we'd say MB monetary base, that's like the base level of money that's out there and the government can directly control it. Now, other measures of the money supply would be kind of going this direction. So we have this one called M1. M1 is all of currency, that's M0, plus something called demand deposits, which are a fancy word for checking accounts. They're sometimes called transaction accounts because people use them to conduct transactions. So you can have unlimited withdrawals and kind of unlimited deposits. It's, it's the idea of like you're, you're constantly flowing back and forth between currency and demand deposits. So actually M1 is usually when people talk about the money supply, that's usually what they're referring to. M2 is a larger supply of the, a measure of the money supply. And this is all of M1. So it includes all of the currency and all the checking accounts, but it adds savings accounts, something called certificates of deposits, and something called money market accounts. So a savings account, you actually have limits on how many times you can withdraw from it in a given period of time. And that's kind of a regulatory framework so that it avoids having a lot more liquidity in the system. The goal being, again, to manage the money supply a little bit. So you have these savings accounts that pay higher interest rates, but you can't quite access your money as easily as a checking account. A certificate of deposit is quite similar. It's the idea that you go to your bank and you say, here's $5,000. I'm going to deposit it with you for an, a given amount of time, six months. And in exchange, I can't touch the money for six months, but I get a higher interest rate. So again, it's very less liquid, right? It's much less liquid because it's stuck in the bank for six months or a year or however long you want. The MMA is a related product as well. It's called a money market account. In those, your, your money is in a savings account, but it actually is kind of being used to purchase other things by the bank. And again, there's regulations on how many times you can withdraw it. So it might take it a day or two to move the money from your MMA or your savings account into your checking account. And, and so again, it's a little bit less liquid. Now, in thinking about financial assets, um, these are kind of some things that, that are money, some things that are not. Um, and this is kind of why we're learning it, so you can kind of discern between the two what, what's money, what's not money. The, all of financial assets are, are just non-physical assets. Now, assets is a fancy word that just means stuff that's worth something, right? Something you own that's worth something. So you could have real estate assets. Um, you could have, you know, all kinds of other assets, you, physical assets like your building. Um, but non-physical assets that are that they have value that comes from a contractual claim that means that like there's a contract or something that creates the value so all of the the list here bank deposits bonds stocks all those would be financial assets some of them are money some of them aren't and so again it comes down to does it perform the three functions very well so the very first type of financial asset is a bank deposit right that's a contractual claim between you the depositor and the bank so bank deposits right are are a financial asset and they are money. They are money in the sense that, you know, they, they perform the three functions pretty well. The second type of, of financial asset is called a loan. And this is not money. And in fact, pretty much all of the rest of these are not money. So we're going to kind of say these are financial assets that don't work as money very well. Loans are just contract borrowing. It basically is a contract between somebody who borrows money and somebody who provides the money. You pay interest uh, periodically and a little bit of the principal back every single uh, month or every single you know week or something like that. So these are, are generally the ideas that you would repay a little bit of the principal of the borrowing amount and a little bit of the interest every single month. Right? That's a, a mortgage or a car loan would work that way. There's a special type of loan called a bond, which is also not money. Um, and these are usually loans that are issued by the government or they're issued by corporations. And in these, they're a weird kind of loan where basically they don't repay the, the balance of the loan, the principal amount of it until the very end. So they pay as they go the interest 
but they don't repay the full chunk of, of the borrowed money until the end. So it's kind of a quirky type of a loan. Now that rate of interest is usually fixed. So you'd have like a bond that pays 5% interest. And there's one thing that I'm gonna say here, and we're gonna kind of circle back to it again and again, is that something kind of weird about bonds. Their price of a bond is actually inversely related to the interest rate on other new bonds. So I'll give you kind of an example to explain what this phrase means, but it's super important um, it shows up over and over again in weird places in this class. So I'm just going to tell you, like, pay attention to this fact, right? Like, this is a weird one. And this is and this throws some kids for a loop. So hopefully it won't. Let's say you have a bond that pays 5% interest, and it's a five-year bond. So every month, the corporation that issued it or the government that issued it pays you a little bit of interest. They pay you 5% on the balance. And at the end of the loan, that's going to repay the whole amount. It doesn't really matter what the whole amount is. And now, all of a sudden, interest rates in the whole, you know, the whole economy, they go up, right? So you had a bond that paid five, <coughs> but interest rates have now risen to, say, 7%. So the very next day, new bonds are going to be issued. They're issued every day, all the time, different companies, governments, that kind of thing. So now new bonds being issued will pay 7%, and your bond only pays five. And it's exactly the same, right? It's a, the same company or the same, you know, all this other stuff. The only difference is now your bond only pays five and new ones pay seven. So if you wanted to sell your bond, you will have to discount it. You'll have to lower the price because people would look at you and be like, ah, why would I buy you a 5% bond? I could buy a 7% bond and it pays a lot better. So in order to, to sell it, you have to lower the price. So the interest rate going up caused your bond to go down in price. Now, the other reverse of that also is true. If you had a 5% bond and interest rates fell, now new bonds are going to be, be issued with only 3%, right? And so you have a 5% bond. You are able to say, listen, you want to buy my bond, you've got to pay me a higher price for it. It's, it's 5%. It's a great bond. It's a really nice bond, 5%. New bonds only pay you three. So you're going to want the 5%. So that's going to drive the value of your bond up. The price of your bond goes up when interest rates go down. That's the idea. Now, other stuff in here. For some reason, I did these out of order um, in, the, in the slide deck. But this is called a stock. Right? A stock is actually a contract share of ownership entitling somebody to profit. So it's your ownership share in a company. Um, you also have the potential for capital gain. The value of the stock might go up if the value of the overall company goes up. It's not the same as investment spending. We've talked about that a number of times, right? So a stock um, is kind of that, there's another form of financial asset, but it's not money. There's also these things called asset-backed securities or ABS. So if you want to write out asset-backed securities, these are portfolios of loans or other, basically, other stuff of value. So oftentimes it's collateralized debt, like mortgage loans are collateralized in the sense that there's a house that you could repossess, um, a car loan, that's kind of an example of that. So retail loans a lot of times are collateralized. Um, and if you put them all together, like in a big package of like $5 million worth of loans, it kind of reduces the risk because if you have one loan, you lose all your money if that person decides they're not going to repay you. Um, but, but if you have 10,000 loans all packaged together, the odds of all of them at once deciding they're not going to repay you are somewhat lower. So a lot of times financial institutions will make asset-backed securities, which are just basically put a bunch of, of stuff all in one. Um, the last thing that's listed here are called mutual funds. And mutual funds are essentially the same concept, right, of put a bunch of stuff together and then you kind of own a chunk of it. Um, it, but with stocks. And so a lot of times we'll do it with stocks or bonds or other securities. You can buy a mutual fund that buys cryptocurrencies, right? So you could have basically a fund that then takes your money and then buys a bunch of other things with it. And so you own a share of the fund that then is kind of subdivided accordingly. The nice thing is, is then you don't have to worry about like buying in all the tiny little underlying assets. So you could buy a, a mutual fund for 500 companies and they, they take your thousand dollars and they slice it up into really tiny little shares of all 500 companies in that in that fund so it's kind of a nice way to do investing um, so all of these things that i've listed here not really money um, the very first thing bank deposits and obviously currency would count all right so that's a lot of information about the basics of money um, and the practice problems hopefully that'll help you wrap your mind around it a little bit more and i'll see you next time uh oh one more thing I didn't. I wanted to show you actually how much money there was. So, so you, you if you stuck around, um, there's 5.2 trillion dollars worth of monetary base, and you can actually see here in the pandemic how they created almost overnight like trillions of dollars worth of money. Uh, there's about 6.9 trillion dollars worth of M1. So, if you're kind of thinking about like how much money is there, there's like what did I say? 5.6. 
there's like 6.9. Um, and of the 6.9 trillion, you can see here that about 2 trillion is currency in circulation. So there's about $2 trillion worth of US currency, and there's close to $20 trillion worth of M2, most of it in the, in the form of savings accounts in the United States. And you can, you can play around with these on thread as well. All right, now I'll see you next time. Bye now.